Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. Right now on the line, we have the speaker of the New York State Assembly, Carl E. Hasty. Welcome, brother. Thank you. Thank you, NV. Thank you, Charlemagne. Thank you, Angela, for having me on the What's show. What's up, King? I'm good. I'm good. Now you have to work today, right? Are you guys convening today about the, these police reforms? What's happening? Well, you know, every day throughout this pandemic is a work day. So we're not in session. So I'm probably more, you know, in the office. Uh, but we did have a, um, a big week last week when it came to uh, doing some of the police reforms. There was a package of about 10 bills that, um, that dealt with many of the issues that people were protesting about bills that were, you know, a long time coming. Um, and I think when, uh, you know, people witnessed what happened with George Floyd, uh, I think uh, the, not only just uh, Minneapolis and New York and other places around the country, I think people around the world just say, you know, enough is enough is enough is enough. Uh, when you see people in places like Syria and Belgium, you know, laying down in the street with their hands behind their backs, uh, saying, I can't breathe, you know, this is one uh, I think that touched people like no others. And, and, I, and this wasn't, uh, you know, any different than, say, what happened to Ramali Graham or Sean Bell or Eric Garner or Amadou Diallo. It's the same type of uh, situation. Um, but for some reason, this seemed to touch a nerve across all, you know, racial lines. And, uh, and you know, as elected officials, sometimes we have to lead our constituents and other times we have to be followed by our constituents. And I think this was a culmination of both. Uh, is why we got to uh, the, the the package that we did, and um, and then depending on what you felt was the most egregious issue, I would say a different bill may appeal more to a different a different audience. But what are some hey, of these bills? Your question. Oh, oh. So, so on fifty eight, uh, the repeal of fifty eight is where the police disciplinary records were not open to FOIL. So oftentimes you had police officers who had multiple complaints that were made against them and they were shielded from FOIL. So with the repeal of 50A, um, you can now get access to their disciplinary records. If people put in a complaint uh, here in the city with uh, CCRB, you will now have access uh, uh, to their records. Um, in, the, in the case of people um, dying at the hands of a police officer, you now have uh, the Attorney General, you know, Tish James, the first African American woman uh, to be elected to that position, will be the special prosecutor in all cases of people um, dying at the hands of the police. There's also a now a special investigative unit in the Attorney General's office where people can just make complaints to the Attorney General's office if they feel that there's some mis, uh, misconduct by the police. Uh, we also have the chokehold bill, which is really a tribute to Eric Garner and, uh, and Anthony Baez, uh, where you can now get a C felony in up to 15 years if you use a chokehold um, on somebody and it causes them a serious physical injury. And I think that's one of the things that people are you know, upset about. You know, sometimes police will be held accountable, but they would never face jail time. Sometimes they would leave the police department, but they would end up working for, um, uh, say, like the, the fire department. And then uh, one that I think is really important, but may not get as much attention, uh, is the STAT Act. And that is when people, particularly people of color, get, um, I'd say, pulled over or there's an interaction with police um, on low-level offenses, you know, because our communities are always uh, over-policed. And so now the, uh, the court system uh, has to keep records on how many uh, you know, young black men, young Latino men have been pulled over for not even misdemeanor, you know, open container, uh, you know, the nuisance violations, those stats will now be held. So that pretty much was the package of bills that we did. Why, why now? Because I'm sure that there's been calls for changes to law enforcement and community relations a, a bunch of times before. What was different this time that New York was able to pass these bills? You know, um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Because, uh, you know, I thought when uh, Amadou Diallo was killed, that was the time, you know, when Sean Bell was killed, I thought that was the time, or Ramali Graham, who was my constituent, uh, was killed, I thought that was the time. Um, but what I really think happened is, because a lot of times when we had these protests, 
it was usually, uh, you know, the black community and the Latino community. But I think when it went across the board and went worldwide, when you literally see a man uh, with a knee on his neck, you know, crying for his, you know, deceased mother, you know, saying, I can't breathe. I think it just touched people in a way uh, that, again, like I said, it's just, you know, enough is enough. And then, you know, this is on, on top of what just happened recently, you know, down in, in Georgia. And it's like these things just kind of power one on top of another. And I just think people just took to the streets and said, you know, enough is enough. So I wanted to ask you about uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. Are we opening up New York too fast? Are you nervous about what's going on with New York opening like this? Especially hey, come I on, slow down. We're the, we're the slowest ones. <laughs> I, uh, well, I'll say this. Um, you know, the actions that we took, New York's infection rates are now some of the lowest in the country. And I think uh, the answer to that question, Indy, is, you know, how are people going to act once we start doing the reopenings? You know, people going to start going to these rooftop events and not wearing masks, you know, you're going to open yourself up to these events. Are we going to have gatherings at restaurants? I think it is vitally important that people abide by the rules of the, of the reopening. Um, we should still be wearing our face coverings. We should still be washing our hands. We should still be carrying a bottle of hand sanitizer, uh, you know, in our pockets. And I think if we do that, I think it will allow us to reopen, but we have to reopen in a responsible way. And everybody has to take self-responsibility in terms of making sure when I go out, I'm still going to wear a mask. If I'm going to gather with my friends, I don't care how close these friends are, I'm still going to wear a mask. I'll drop the mask if I want to, you know, take a, you know, a sip of water if I'm sitting outside, you know, at a, at a restaurant. I think we cannot let our guard down because you've seen across the nation, there's been some spikes, uh, you know, from people reopening too fast and not in a responsible way. You know what I wanted to ask you about these police reforms? How do the police officers feel about them? Or is this getting support from the police department as well? Well, I don't think um, the police are very happy, uh, most, but I, I can tell you some police departments around the state, uh, you know, did support it. I, you know, I believe the Rochester Police Department supported it. We even had some Republicans vote for these bills. Originally, originally when uh, Andrew Stewart Cousins and I and our conferences agreed on the package of bills. We thought it was just going to be Democrats voting yes and Republicans voting no. But I believe on the chokehold bill, I think only uh, like three Republicans actually even voted no on the, on the chokehold bill. I think it's hard to argue against, you know, whether you're Democrat or Republican, that these changes uh, were vitally needed. And so, <clears throat> of course, they're not happy. Um, but I think it's, it's hard for any individual person. Listen, even when George Floyd was killed, you know, there were a lot of people who spoke out and said that what had happened to him uh, was, was horrendous, and that's not how policing should be happening. What, what, what are your thoughts on the, the agenda to defund the police? Well, the outtake that I take from defunding the police is people want to see a reshuffling of the deck of how government spends its money. We should be spending more money on education. We should be spending more money on mental health services. We should be spending more money on, on our youth. We should be spending more money on social programs that lessens the likelihood that you will have an interaction with, with the police. And I think that's the outtake that I take as the Speaker of the Assembly and how we want to look at upcoming budgets. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we're spending in a social way so that people don't even have to interact with the police. Now, I was talking the other day about this uh, reassignment of the undercover anti-crime officers, 600 plainclothes police officers. So what happens there? So there still will be plainclothes police officers, right? And what happens to the undercover? Well, I guess that's still more of a decision for the police department to make. Um, the laws that we passed didn't really uh, restrict them on how they deploy mm -hmm. Uh, their officers, you know, we are still hoping that uh, eventually, you know, the, Mayor de Blasio said he wanted to have more of a, poli a community policing model. I think uh, that's where we have to go. I think it's, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, uh, young people and you're, you know, just hanging out in front of your building and you know, you know, Officer Smith, because you see him all the time and he comes over, he says, guys, how you doing? If, you know, if it's not always an, an acrimonious, you know, interaction, people will respond, I think, differently. But if every time the police are, are interacting with you, it's, you know, 
you know, uh, aggressive and on the wall. something's wrong. Right. Or something's wrong. So I think we have to get back to more of a friendly thing. You know, there's times you've seen, you know, police officers will go shoot baskets with, you know, with the kids in, in the park. And I think that's what we have to do so that, you know, police officers seem more friendly to people and, and people don't seem to be intimidated. I was watching a video of a, of a young, uh, young black girl who, when she saw a police officer, she started to get nervous and, and cry. And the police officer approached her and, mm-hmm. and, st- and tried to uh, get into a conversation with her and say, you know, and try to be friendly. And I think we have to see, you know, much, much more of that. It can't just always be, I'm going to interact with you because I'm coming to, uh, you know, find out whether you were doing something wrong. And why are these politicians so in the police union pockets, man? I saw AOC tweet something the other day that was so real, and she was saying how things will never change because politicians are too in bed with the police unions. Because you look at well, de Blasio, de Blasio be rolling over for the cops, man. Listen, I think that's a, that's a you know political statement that people make. I have never in my life been moved by political contributions. I, honestly, I have an entire uh, team that looks at my campaign contributions. But what I will tell you is, um, most of the money that I get in campaign contributions, I've spent uh, assisting families with funerals, giving money out to different uh, uh, organizations that have been helping out, giving money to food pantries. That's what a lot of us do with our campaign, our campaign funds. Uh, so, you know, it's a nice, you know, slogan to say, well, you, you took a contribution. I mean, you could come up with a, a reason to uh, take away anybody's contribution, but I can tell you right now, I think between my stances on on criminal justice reform from bail discovery and speedy trial and now police reforms, I don't think anybody could think that I'm in the pocket of the police department. If anything, I'm probably one of the most despised people uh, by the police departments based on the actions that, you know, that I've said was important to me as the Speaker of the Assembly. Well, Carl, we and, uh, appreciate you for checking in. The Speaker of the New York State Assembly. And thank you again. We, we definitely appreciate you checking in. Yeah, keep us updated thank on what's going on. I- I think the mental health uh, experts going with the police too is a great thing as well. That's part of that bill also, right? Well, one of the things that Andrew, you bring that up, you know, when you look at the case of Eleanor Bumpers, you know, who was, you know, killed, I think it was in the uh, mid to late eighties, you know, she was a 75 year old woman and the police came in, you know, she clearly had mental health issues and there was a different way they could have handled that situation. Um, and so we do think that there should be a coupling that when there's someone who may have a mental health issue, you know, maybe you need to have a social worker there on the scene, uh, so that it doesn't escalate into a a point, uh, where the only recourse they feel is to, um, you know, disarm somebody in a very aggressive way with a taser or, or with, with a bullet. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for checking in. Call Hasty. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.